Kia ora, bonjour. Um, today I'll be talking about life for enslaved people on a French colonial plantation in 1690. Uh, I've called the paper Dibia's People. Um, it's named after uh, one of the, uh, the, the people featured on the uh, plantation. Uh, Dibia was born in 1647, um, in, uh, probably in the Igbo culture of what is now Southeast Nigeria. And uh, there he received an education as a Dibia, as a healer, uh, a scientist, if you like. Um, but as a young man, he was uh, captured, transported across the Atlantic and enslaved on the Rimia plantation of uh, France's colony of Cayenne in French Guyana. Um, during his enslavement, he rose to a prominent position on the plantation. Um, but it didn't prevent him being savagely beaten by an overseer and subsequently left to die. Um, we know all of this about Dibia because he is uh, one of the people described in the manuscript of Jean Goupy, a French slaver and planter, uh, who wrote some 400 pages about his experiences in the early 1690s. Um, Ten of those pages featured the uh, biographies of uh, the slaves of the Rumia plantation, and they've been discussed by scholars, but the full manuscript and its context uh, have not, and this is uh, what we'll be looking at today. Um, it's, it's a very, very important manuscript because it provides us with a lot of information about uh, life for enslaved people on an early sugar plantation. A lot of the information we have about uh, plantation life uh, for enslaved people is um, really from the 19th or second half of the 18th centuries, um, such important works as uh, Dunn's A Tale of Two Plantations from 2014. Um, but these studies feature little personal information about the enslaved people simply because the records don't show a lot of information about them. We, we have basic data, but we don't have them as uh, individuals with uh, different personalities. And as a result, uh, scholars have often resorted to what uh, Shaw calls educated reconstructions when um, after finding out about the historical and archeological records, the historian uh, and resorts to a little bit of creative writing to try and reconstruct life for uh, enslaved people. We don't need to do that um, because Jean Goupy's manuscript provides a substantial amount of detail. Um, just very quickly, some background information about the author. Um, he came from a well-to-do Parisian family. He was a skilled draftsman. That's probably his self-portrait you can see in the image uh, on screen. His uncle owned the plantation in Cayenne, um, and Goupy went out there as a young man to visit it, and he subsequently became a, an agent of France's slaving company in Ouida in West Africa, where he spent four years and was directly responsible for the transportation and enslavement of thousands of uh, Africans. Um, Goupy then went to uh, the colony of Cayenne again, this time as manager of the plantation, but he didn't do a very good job because his uncle sacked him after 18 months and Goupy returned to Paris and wrote up the manuscript um, that's the subject of this paper. Now in the manuscript, we find out about more than a hundred enslaved people on the Rimia plantation. Um, most of them were alive on 1st of May, 1690. They were almost all African, although there were three enslaved Native Americans taken from the Amazon region. Um, and 11 others, including Dibia, had died in the two years prior to that date. And we see in the image um, the start of the uh, biographies, Jean, Jean de Laplace. Now that's his slave name. What's very rare is that uh, Goupy provides us with his African name, as he does with most of the other enslaved people of the plantation. Um, he had a, a curiosity and interest in um, 
uh, West Africa after his time there. Now, when we look at not only the biographies, but descriptions of uh, daily life on the plantation in his manuscript, uh, there's a lot of information about uh, the experiences of the enslaved people. Uh, we see a, a consistent trend uh, throughout the document, which shows us that enslaved men and enslaved women had very different experiences on the plantation. Um, there were far more men than women, and the men occupied all of the senior roles, um, the, the black overseer, the sugar makers, and so on. Um, they occupied all of the artisanal roles as well, like uh, the potter and the roofer and the carpenter. Um, they worked in the sugar refinery building that you see uh, to the left um, with the uh, seven pans of sugar syrup being evaporated over seven fires, all of that run by the men. It meant that they had some variety in their work, which in itself was a little bit of respite, and it also meant that um, sometimes the work was not as physically onerous as field work. Now, um, their work was certainly uh, very, very onerous indeed, but for the women, it was worse. Uh, they used the Isabel Dibia, Dibia's widow. Um, she, like uh, almost all of the other women of the plantation, did not have any particular occupation described uh, or associated with them, save for two laundresses, an assistant cook, and a woman who'd served as mistress to the three previous planters. Um, the women did not have occupations listed because they were field workers. Um, they were the ones who had the, the, the drudgery of working in a line, constantly under supervision, uh, in the cane fields, um, digging holes to plant the cane, weeding it, cutting it. Um, almost every woman on the plantation was involved in that work. On top of that uh, very monotonous labor with with no respite, they also had to deal with childcare and they had to cook the midday meals for their family. So we see very different roles. And one of the consequences is that um, there were few children born and a few children uh, who survived. Um, the women were simply too busy, um, too fatigued um, for there to be a positive demographic trend when it came to uh, children. Um, so a very small proportion of the plantation's uh, enslaved community is under the age of 16. They're all actually locally born. Um, the slaves were transported as adults, or captors were transported as adults rather than children. And there are signs uh, not only of a low birth rate, but also of high infant and child mortality such as in the illustration at the bottom of the screen, we have a brother and sister, Marc and René. Uh, there's a seven year age difference and it seems that no children survive from those seven years and nor were any children born after uh, René uh, in the four years since then. And uh, in the rare other cases of women who have more than one surviving child, we see uh, similar age gaps. We also see uh, differences uh, in relationships, the official relationships at least, between men and women. Um, every woman on the plantation was married, save for a few widows past childbearing age, and save for Isabel Tibia. And we could expect that the plantation manager would shortly find her another husband. Um, this would not be her choice. Um, the regulations of slavery stated that uh, slaves should be free to choose their spouse, but uh, there's clear evidence that this was not the case. Um, most of the marriages on the plantation are inter-ethnic. In the illustration from the manuscript below, we see that Bazo, his slave name is Paul. Uh, he is from uh, Ouida and Luisia is uh, from the Angola Congo region. So linguistically and culturally, they had nothing in common and yet they were married. This was not Luisia's choice. Like most of the wives, she arrived on a later ship than the husband. And like most of the wives, it appears that uh, her first child was born about a year after her arrival. Um, so clearly she was married very soon after her arrival, 
Um, and what we're seeing here, I mean, she didn't have a choice. If she'd been able to choose, she would probably have chosen one of the seven or eight Angola Congo men who were uh, enslaved at the same time as she was on that plantation. Instead, she was married to Basil. Um, so what we see here, I mean, we're looking at eugenics in practice, um, and on top of that, women being used as an incentive uh, for the men. The rewards, if the man works hard, he'll be rewarded with a wife on the next ship. The manuscript also gives us uh, very detailed information about uh, the remarkably heavy workload of enslaved people on the plantation. 130 days a year, the plantation swung into sugar production mode. This was when it became a factory. And you know, this is where the Industrial Revolution starts, on the, the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Um, the slaves had to work alternating 12 and 24 hour shifts was very dangerous work. Women in the fields all day, in the factory part at, uh, at night, um, only 12 hours respite over a 48 hour period during uh, production mode. Um, the instrument or the machine you see on the right is the key piece of machinery of a sugar plantation. It is the sugar mill powered by water. Um, it was women's work. One woman would sit on either side of the mill and feed the cut cane through. Um, the woman on the other side would feed it back through the other gap in the rollers. The juice would be squeezed out, uh, caught below, and sent into the refinery. It was very dangerous work, uh, moments in the tension in the 24-hour shift, and fingers could be caught and crushed in those rollers. Um, when the plantation wasn't in production mode, um, there was plenty of other work assigned to the enslaved workers. And again, we see significant variation between the roles of what the men had and the women had. The women doing the, the weeding and the, the planting, uh, and the men uh, having a greater variety of tasks. It's not surprising when you see that sort of workload that um, the slaves' uh, physical health was affected. And uh, there are many reasons for that. Um, and it's, it's uh, quite remarkable how many of the enslaved women had uh, injured legs and feet. This is not only from sleeping on the ground, it's also, also from the digging and planting in the soil and the, uh, cutting themselves on the cane um, uh, during uh, their work. Um, so many of them had infections that didn't heal, had, uh, parasites in their feet, and so on. Um, there were many other factors that affected their physical health. Um, what's remarkable in the manuscript is that we also see evidence of um, enslaved people being affected uh, mentally by their enslavement as well. People who seem to be uh, physically fit, but who are described as useless, uh, one young man, uh, again, physically fit, but described as being good only for making nets. Clearly, the problems here are not physical, they're mental. It's not surprising, of course, given the trauma of capture, the middle passage, transportation across the Atlantic, and then enslavement without hope, without a future, that uh, people's mental health would be affected. But it's remarkable to see it mentioned even um, discreetly in uh, the manuscript when planters were usually so focused on getting the most out of slaves physically and treating them as units of labor. Um, there were some positive signs in the manuscript um, of people rejecting their enslavement uh, whenever they could. Um, there was unsupervised work, again available to the men far more than, well, than to the women, um, such as looking after cattle and uh, Kupi had many complaints to say about the young men assigned to this role. Um, there was also evidence of uh, subversion, not quite sabotage, but certainly subversion, trying to work as slowly as possible, finding hindrances where there were none, and so on. Of course, it's quite understandable, given that there were no incentives to work harder. There's also evidence of an illicit market, uh, not just uh, taking place within the slave community, but also between enslaved people and the uh, slave owning population uh, and cases of an African man selling something to uh, his owner uh, 
Um, and there's also uh, there are also signs of people leaving the plantation either short term, going absent without leave for a day or two, or longer term, simply leaving the plantation. Three of Louisia's compatriots had left the plantation permanently and were living in the hills nearby. Now the plantation or the, the colony at the time had only been a slave-based plantation colony for 30 years. And it seems that uh, the practices of hunting down people had not yet uh, been fully developed. But those three Angola Congo people living in the hills, they were the forerunners of um, what would be independent villages living beyond the reach of colonial forces in the 18th and 19th centuries in French Guyana. And saving uh, something that stands out the most as we wrap up this paper, um, the manuscript also features the voices of the enslaved. People were not uh, treated by Gupi just as labor units. They were individuals. He respected them in many cases, and he reported their opinions. Um, it's, it's very, very unusual to find something like this for the 17th century. Um, so we hear the opinions of uh, displaced uh, Africans and Native Americans in the manuscript. Now, certainly it's been refracted through uh, Gupi's writing, but we still see them treated as individuals, especially Dibia. Um, now, part of this is, of course, due to Gupi's personality, um, but there is also the fact that we're dealing with a 17th century colony in the very early stages of its establishment, as I say, only 30 years old at the time, quite unlike um, a lot of the, 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 the studies that have been carried out, as I said earlier, on 19th and second half of the 18th centuries, when slavery and colonies it was much more institutionalized and there was a nucleus within the slave population of Creoles, people born locally who'd never known freedom, who'd never known anything but the plantation. Here on this 17th century plantation, almost every adult on the plantation was born in Africa, educated in Africa, and had experienced freedom. And I think that comes across in the manuscript, and it shows that we can't necessarily extrapolate uh, documents we read about the 18th and early 19th centuries and assume that things were the same in the 17th century. Thank you.